All right, last, uh, the next to the last class that we just did was, uh, we got into Romans 6, and uh, I sort of said at the end of that that we were going to be able to move into 1 Corinthians 8 and Matthew 25, but I lied. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I did repent you know, uh, for the wrong. I didn't turn. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, there are some differences here. You need to stick with the stick with it. <laughs> um, so we are going to be in uh, Romans 6. Uh, one of the things I said is that we would do the latter half of Romans 6. So I'd like to do that, <clears throat> and I'd like to, to read this first, just read through it. Um, and I want you to not be spiritual. Just read what it says and see how you feel. <laughs> Mallory knows. <laughs> okay, starting with verse 12. This is uh, Romans uh, 6, starting with verse 12. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. Amen, y'all? Amen. Amen. Stop it. <laughs> did, you say, <laughs> did you say we're not supposed to do that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. That you should obey it in the lust thereof, neither yield ye, uh, yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Does this sound familiar at all? Okay. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked. Amen? <laughs> I mean, he's encouraging us. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. So, <clears throat> interesting, uh, because probably most of you know how to quote that last verse there. Um, For the wages of sin is death, but what? is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, so, and probably the best part that you, you remember is for the wages of sin is death. Okay, that's probably the part that I'm sure you have down, which, uh, uh, which is really, for the most part, by people quoted out of context. Because they're quoting that as if to a sinner that has not been born again. Amen. It's, it's exactly the context. This is, this is not quoting to sinners who have not been born again. Now, if you have done that, God will forgive you. <laughs> I'm sure God has used it and will use it no matter what because it's his word. However, more importantly than that is that he has, um, he has put that in the context 
of those who are born again. And it starts with coming out of Romans 5 into Romans 6. Um, what shall we say then? And he's saying, what shall we say then to those who he has clearly shown, particularly in chapter 3 and 4, clearly shown that, uh, and 5 actually, that you are in Christ and that he has done a work that has um, of, uh, brought you into him, not just, not just saved you. You know, we say, I was saved from sin. You know, when, you, know you were, how's it say in, in the book of Revelation? You were redeemed unto God, who hath redeemed us unto God. Wow, that's quite different. Because we're all trying to, you know, get away from something. And he has in his mind not us getting away. Yes, of course, you know, I use that example. I mean, if, if I was over here with, with somebody who's being mean and ugly to me, and Jesus was over here, and so they're being mean and ugly to me, and I decided I was going to go leave them and go over here. Hopefully, I'm not just leaving mean and ugly. That's his actual name. <laughs> his last name is Ugly. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to Jesus. I'm going after Jesus. Paul said, I press towards the mark of the prize of high calling. I'm not just trying to get rid of guilt and shame and sin and the devil and then because if guilt shame sin and the devil is over here and you leave that and you're going to Jesus you are leaving it but you're actually in your heart and your motive are going unto him okay because that's a lot better than staying there and fighting that stuff just trying to defeat it in your life you know uh, that, that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do, is get all wrapped up in, in the circumstances and in this life and in your problems and this and that and not to focus on him because the closer you get to him, you're going to be, see his face and be changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, as it says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So, um, so this is... <clears throat> this is this is speaking to those who have been born again, and he has given in chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5, he has given strong assurances to us that we are in Christ. Amen? Yes. All right. So he doesn't, he doesn't get in Romans 6 and say, well, you're not really that secure. <laughs> He doesn't do that. In fact, he brings in that new aspect of what happened in Christ to you. See, he brings in another aspect. But before this, Romans 6, most of it was getting rid of your guilt and your shame and your the sin and, and, and uh, you're con being controlled by the devil and you're controlled by... You know, you, by you constantly, you know, doing sins. And he's saying that you've been forgiven and your sins are forgiven and your sins are forgiven. Amen? Amen. And Jesus died on the cross and his blood was shed 2,000 years ago, but it still is covering your sins today. Right? Okay. So he gets to that point and everybody's going, oh, goody, good, you know. Goody, goody, this is great. I can, you know, my sin, I can sin, but I have the blood, you know. And um, so he's, he's trying to bring to bear a reality that uh, has also taken place in Christ, or you being in him when certain things happened. You were in him when certain things took place in Romans 6. <clears throat> things over which you have no control, just like everything else already that happened in Christ 2,000 years ago, right? You don't have any control over that in the sense of, of uh, uh, it's done, it's settled. You're in him on those issues. However, 
he's introducing a new aspect, and that aspect is this aspect of our being, you know, dead with Christ. <clears throat> All right, but when you read Romans 6, 12, has anybody ever tended toward reading Romans 6, 1 through 11 and left off 12 through, what is it, 23? Yeah, I think that, that would be a common thing. Why? I think because we think somehow he's back trying to deal with us like under the law. Yeah. Yeah. Like we can see, you know, verses 1 through 11 clearly dealing with us by the cross and dealing with us in Christ, our death in Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. You can see that and you, you, can, you can hang your hat on that. Amen? But you start getting into to verse 12, and it starts really kind of, you know, going, oh, it doesn't use the word cross. It doesn't use the word uh, death. It does. But the tendency in verse 12 through 23 is the wages of sin is death. It's talking about this is, you know, to go this way leads to death. Whereas the first ver verses dealt with death. But it was our death with him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the things we tend to do is compartmentalize. We, we do that with the scriptures. We see certain scriptures in this compartment and then this one. But, but then like in this, we've got two different compartments. When in truth, he's saying the same things, but he's trying to get to a certain point. Now, here's the thing. When, two, when, when we, we assume it's two compartments, when two compartments are directly joined together, there's a good chance that there's not two compartments. Yeah. It's still saying the same thing, but you cannot leave the first part. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And if I've seen this once, I've seen it probably, probably a thousand times at least in my sharing and ministering and counseling and everything else with people is that <clears throat> they will read something here and they'll, you know, the old phrase we used to use is they, they'll get the victory. <laughs> you know, I got the victory. Praise God. Yes, the cross is the victory. Yes, this and that and that. And then they get over in places like this and it's like sinking sand. It's, it's like quicksand. They start going down fast and they go, you know, they lose everything that went before. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm this or whatever. Yeah, you are. But the, the first half of the chapter said that the, you are something else. There's your life here, but the first... Uh, 11 verses said, but first, you're something in Christ. What are you first in Christ in, in Romans 6? Dead. 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 Okay. So, Romans 12 on down sounds like it's trying to deal with you by the law when, in fact, he's actually saying it's not by the law. Did I just have a thought and y'all heard it? <laughs> anyway, you know, we think that. We think that, you know, well, he's, he's, he's trying to deal with my flesh, okay? He is dealing with our flesh, but he's not leaving the reality. He wants you to take that in with it. So, okay, so do we do stuff like that in books of the Bible? Do we read Romans 1 and then Romans 1 is one thing and Romans 2 is another thing? That's where, that's where we got to talking about, uh, you know, Romans 1 is to filthy, rank, perverted sinners that live, you know, and do things that you shouldn't even talk about or mention, especially in church. Um, and then we go to the Jews. And we go, well, the Jews, they blew it, man. They should have, you know, they should have believed in Jesus, you know. And so then it goes all the way through. And 
The whole point of that chapter one and all of that is to say you're exactly that because that's the way God sees sin. That or the Jews or this and that. It's all missing the mark. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think it's something like harmashi or something like that. And it's in the Greek and it is speaking of not, you know, not just doing something wrong, but not hitting the mark that he wants you to hit. And the mark he wants you to hit is Christ and him crucified. That's the mark. That's the, you know, what does he say in the, uh, 1 Corinthians 2? 2, 2, is it? I'm determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. You know? Um, that's become a mark to him. You know? I remember when I was in Bible school, and I remember somebody reading that scripture, you know, because you get a lot of scriptures read to you when you're in Bible school. <laughs> you know, and I remember, and he said, he read it, and he said, I am determined not to know anything among you but save Christ and him crucified. And I said, you know, well, I'm determined to know Christ and him crucified. Thinking I was saying the same thing as that scripture. And so I went back and I took another closer look at it. It didn't say I'm determined to know Christ and him crucified. He said I'm determined not to know anything save Christ and him crucified. That's different. Okay. So I remember when it dawned on me that that's what it said. Okay. Basically it's saying I'm determined only to know Christ and him crucified. And I'm going, well... You know, what about, you know, family matters? Or what about, you know, all, you know, all these other things that are so important? Bless you. And, uh, again, <laughs> not really. Sneeze all you want, girl. Um, and, uh, and I remember thinking, how can you do that? How can you even do that in the Bible? I mean, there's the subject yeah. of righteousness, and there's the subject of, of deliverance, and there's the subject of da-da-da-da, all that kind of stuff, you know. And you're going, I don't, I don't get that at all. In fact, you know, that was, that was another excuse for me to sort of back off from the cross, and I was thankful for the excuse. <laughs> you know, although I was missing the mark of that also. You know, I was missing the reality of it. For example, <clears throat> deliverance, we say, well, he's given us authority and we can go cast out the de demons and stuff like that. And that doesn't have anything to do with Christ and him crucified. Well, uh, okay, in the, in the New Testament relationship, not before the cross, but after the cross, he says that we have been delivered Amen. from the power of darkness. We have been delivered from the power of darkness. Have we been delivered from the presence of darkness? No. No, we haven't been delivered. The devil's still running around doing stuff. But his power, he does not have power over us unless, of course, we use our free will and we let him have that. Or because we want something and if the devil's offering it to us, we'll go, okay, I'll. But, you know, you can't rule my life because I love Jesus. But you can have this, this compartment, this room, you know, on the sixth floor. <laughs> so... You know, and, and we feel good about that because we've got all kind of stuff going on in us. So many apartments, you know, that, you know, it's like there's just that, you know. And, of course, you know, he, he uh, slips out at night and tries to break into the other rooms and stuff like that and spread his influence, all right? But the Scripture declares not just authority that Jesus talked about when the disciples before the cross, I give you authority over the devil, right? The scriptures start talking about for you're dead, you know, uh, uh, through death, he delivered him that had the, how is it? 
the power of death, that is the devil. Okay? Okay, and then I have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Anybody see the cross in that? Absolutely. <laughs> you better. <laughs> or you're still wide open. You know what I mean? You have no, no protection. Um, because you were delivered from that by being in Christ. You were delivered from that by Christ taking you to the cross. You were delivered by uh, that by being raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The, all of that is greater than a deliverance. What's another word that could be greater than a deliverance? What? Dead is good. What else? Okay, yeah, but most people wouldn't connect that. Oneness. You're made one in Him. And that has brought you to places you could never go. Amen. You know, you know, you, you still have victory over the enemy here, but that's as the reality that you were in Christ 2,000 years ago and certain things happen that is real in you so that you walk as if you're in Him. Okay, now Paul said that, right? In Him we live. See, he didn't say in Him we believe. In Him we live and we move and we have our being. But that reality does have a manifestation in our earthen vessels. And that's what the beginning line of Romans 6 is trying to address. What shall we say then? So we continue in sin that grace may abound. And you get a similar uh, thing down in verse 12 on down. But the first six verses are, uh, it's almost as if you could say the first six verses of Romans 6 are dealing with what happened to him and therefore you at the cross and in the resurrection. Okay, well, do you need some examples of that? Um, uh, know you not that it's so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we walk in newness of life. Listen to that last verse. It does not say you were raised. It says Christ was raised. You have to be in him. You have to understand that. that you have to live in that. You have to. It can't be a doctrine because there's no power in the doctrine of the cross. The power is in the, in the reality of that. And that power comes through union with Christ and, and believing in. See, the scriptures most of the time are talking about believing into him. When it says, I believe in Jesus, it's actually saying the Greek word there. Am I right or wrong, Mallory? Does it say into him? Believing into him. So you're going, well, I'm in him. Okay. And that's good. From verse 6 down to 11. Well, I'm in him. Well, I am dead. See, it's the, the best you can do with that is reckon on it. You know, and I've heard a lot of explanations for reckoning, but I still, you know, I still think that, you know, because it's a, um, uh, what's it called? Accounting. People, what Accounting term where you just, you just keep coming up with the same number, the same answer, and you go, well, I... Reckon I'm dead. <laughs> you know, you, you, <laughs> you know, Texas hits you straight between the eyes and you reckon you are. Um, so, um, so that's what that's about. But you have to be confronted with the actual realities that will challenge that or I say realities, the actual real things like your flesh or this or that or circumstances, you have to be challenged by those things. 
Okay? And the importance of that is to prove if you're in Christ in a living way, not a theological way. Okay? Now, I know, I know this because I went through this when I was in Bible school. I remember clearly I'd go, okay, you know, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And then I'd go out of the class and I'd go, I'm dead. You know, woohoo, I'm dead, da 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 da. And I'd do something. I'd go, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. And I'd come back and I'd go, you know, and I'd read and the Lord would show me something. I'm dead, yes, I'm dead. Praise God, I'm dead, I'm dead. You know, and then do something and go, dang it. That's also Texan. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not dead. Because I believed that if it was true in Christ, it needs to eventually manifest in my mortal flesh. Okay? And it didn't right away. I thought just, just seeing it in the Word and really seeing it by the Holy Spirit, I'd go, oh, praise God. Everything's dead, you know. Well, he didn't kill everything. He crucified you with him. You know, so, um, so again, Romans six twelve on down to 23, that's really dealing with you in relationship to the first 11 verses. You are not supposed to forget the first 11 verses. You are supposed to stand on it and then see and the wonderful thing, this is a wonderful thing, I think, of, of Romans uh, 12 through 23 is that for the most part, he doesn't use the same language in verses 1 through 11. Yeah. He wants you to see it there. He wants you to apply it. Because he's almost saying the same thing, but he's using different utensils. You know, he started with knives. Sharp knives, and then he's using spoons. <laughs> and you're supposed to, yeah, well, you're supposed to appropriate the verse 12 on down. You're supposed to appropriate that in light of what Jesus did, his death, his life, his oneness that he's given us. You, all of that, we're not supposed to run from it or let it get us down or go, oh, this is putting me under the law. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is, okay, so do I need to read it again to see if I can put you back under the law? <clears throat> Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. See? See? What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, he never mentions mortal body in that verse, does he? But he mentions it here. Because now, okay, okay, baby, it's time to grow up. <laughs> Time to, you know, we say growth is my great, vast knowledge of the deep things of God. And he says, no, your growth is in the life and nature of Christ. And the ability to fight off the law or the devil with the truth. And when I say fight off, I don't just, I don't mean get in a battle and hope you win. I mean you, having done all, stand. Amen. See? I'm sorry. I, I remember I said that once, Lord. Lord, I've been fighting the enemy. I've been all this stuff going through this, and I've just done everything I know to do. <laughs> he said, well, having done all, stand. I'm going, Hallelujah. all right, here I am. <laughs> of course, he means stand in it. Yeah. Stand in it. Having read verses 1 through 11, Stand on it through verses 12 through 23. But more than stand on it, learn how to weave in and out of those tricky verses that will either put you under the law or bring you under condemnation because you, you know, well, I, you know, I've done this or I've, you know, this or that, all that kind of stuff. And find the truth and let it be. I love to see there are a few things in verse 12 on down that are really, really good. See, really good, real, well worded even, you know, that could have been in the upper part. So let's just look at some of those and feel like I'm preaching tonight. Um, 
Verse 12 then, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. All right. So, so, you know, don't let it. Don't, uh -uh. don't let it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying based on verses 1 through 11, and being dead with Christ, reckon on it, and therefore you won't let it. Let is not a, a warrior, you know, word. It's a yielding word. Reign in your mortal body. So, so now he's never mentioned mortal body like that in those first 11 verses. He never mentioned mortal bodies like that. He, yes, he did mention the body some and this and that, but, but really most of that is dealing with his body and us being in him. Okay? So that you should obey it in it and the lust thereof. All right. So we're going, okay, as soon as the word obey gets used, we go flipping out, you know, because it, it's a law thing to us. Well, I have to obey. Okay, I didn't obey. Uh, and, you know, the word lust there is just desires that are not flowing with his nature. Um. So we go, you know, we, we see the worst. Okay, okay, I didn't obey it. And it said lusts. Ah, there's no hope for me. You're already down the tubes, you know. There's no standing on, you know, whatever happened to, oh, I know, I know Romans 6, 1 through 11. I know, do you? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You ain't even good through one verse hardly after that, you know, that challenges it. That's right. You know, you can quote it, but you can't live it, and you can't even quote it in the circumstance because you don't realize it's the same, it's, this is the place. You know? So you end up fighting this and going, okay, I'm back under the law, and I'm trying to get hold of it and get right with God. All right? Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't do it. See, don't do it. That's what we're getting. No, no. Don't you do that. And he's going, he's going, you need to understand these kind of wordings that come, that it's like, it's like Mount Hermon when the ice is melting and going down and forming the Jordan River that you get baptized in it down there. You know, like Romans 1, uh, Romans 6, 1 through 11 is Mount Hermon and uh, the snow starts melting so that fresh, clean water flows down and you get in that Jordan and you get baptized in it. And he even uses the word baptized in Romans 6. <clears throat> well, I believe in baptism. I got wet once, you know. It's not about getting wet once, you know. There's a reality, a living reality, an eternal reality. It's not just, well, I'm a Christian now, so I should do this. And I'm going to do it. Because, you know, everybody at the church wants me to do it in front of everybody. <laughs> so I'm going to do it when I come up. I'm going to come up with both hands going, woo you know. I'm alive. And then, you know, if I'm doing the baptism, I'll take you back down. <laughs> you know, just watch, watch how glorious you come up, you know. <laughs> All right. So, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Okay. Well, how do I not do that? Uh, and your members... Uh, uh, for sin, let's see, where am I? Your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. There it is. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. He didn't say yield yourself unto God as a Christian. Come on, Christian. Come on, do the right thing. Yes. Work at it. You got to work at it. You know? No. No. You're, you can't work at it if you're dead. <laughs> you know, you can go over and, you know, a, a guy that was your partner and, and you were doing 
plumbing for years to, years together, and all of a sudden he drops dead, and you say, "Hey, uh, hey, buddy, you're kind of falling behind there. I'm, my pipes are getting all moved along here, and you need to get up. Get up, you, you know. That's you. You're the dead plumber." <laughs> And, and the other plumber, that's somebody who's still under the law trying to get you to be something that's alive. That's right. Doesn't matter. You know, and, and the scriptures will tug at you like that, as if that's what it's saying to you. And that's not what this is saying. And if nowhere else, this should teach us that we need to see deeper into the rest of the scriptures when we start getting under the law or, or getting under condemnation, whatever terms you want to use. Um, but yield yourselves unto God. It didn't say yield yourself at that point unto righteousness. He's going to set, he's making a bridge where at the last part, he can say anything he wants and you're going to identify in the cross. <laughs> it's going to get worse, but right now he's, it's less, it's less, but, but, uh, uh, but yield yourselves unto God. Okay. And the guy's got to be God. It's got to be God. Wait, not just it's got to be God, as those that are alive from the dead. Okay, so the life out of death is what in Romans 6, 1 through 11? It's Christ. Like as Christ was raised from the dead. Uh, where is that real quick? That like as Christ, that's verse halfway through verse 4. Like, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, you walk in newness of life or new life. It didn't say you were raised. I said that earlier. It is Christ who he, whom he raised, and you walk in the new life that is Christ. See, okay. So he's saying the same thing here. Unto God as those that are alive from the dead, which is you have to go in your mind, you have to say, well, I know that it was Christ, not me. He is the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. And you, you talk to the scriptures. Right. No, I'm serious. You say, I know what you're trying to say. And if you're not, Lord, you're going to have to redo yeah. this thing then. But he is. He stick, he's not going to change on his yeah. son or the cross or any of that. Okay? So... As member, uh, and, uh, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. In other words, that life now is the righteousness of God. Has it said that anywhere else in the scriptures? Yes. Has it? Anybody know where? 1 Corinthians 1.30. And what's it say? For of God, Christ has been made unto you righteousness, wisdom, and sanctification. That no flesh of glory is for this. The way you said that, have you been talking in, to your relatives up north? Because that was. <laughs> I'm fixing to go there. I hope not. <laughs> okay. But he has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that he that glory is, let him glory in the Lord. He's made that to you so that you don't glory in you. And you stand on that and you, you hold all the scriptures that blatantly said it and you. You apply it in the ones that want you to apply it. And verses 12 to 23 are applying verses. Yeah. Yeah. And you should apply the verses that went before. You, you don't forget it. Yeah. All right? All right. So, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Okay. And you're going, well, but it did. <laughs> right? But it did have dominion over me. Oh, no. And then you start slipping away. You know? Um, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay. So what? Uh, okay. Let me, before I say that, all of a sudden, it appears that we have been moved into a situation of the contrast of law and grace based on these scriptures. Meaning, am I under the law or not under the law? Okay. So 
then we everything changes in us. Really, seriously, I know this. I've been around Christians since I was in my early 20s. I know it. I've, I've seen it in me, not lately, but I've seen it in me, and I've seen it in you. And I've seen that all of a sudden a change now like this, uh, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. And so, okay, it's a situation of law and grace. And in our mind, the situation of law and grace is law demands that I do certain things, and grace forgives me when I fail. That's not what these scriptures are talking about. That's not the context. The context is still Romans 6, 1 through 11. Okay? But he knows that they're going to go there. So he set them up. He set them up. All right. Um, so let me read that again. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And so what, what is he describing as grace? What is he, de this side of the room, what is he describing as grace? Somebody on this side. Being dead with Christ. <clears throat> is that the truth or not? It is, yes. That's the truth. Amen. It ha we have left the cross and moved into law or grace, and, if, and, and I'm not going to get under the law and be forced to do stuff, so Jesus will forgive me. And that's not the answer. The cross is the answer. And the grace that is being applied here is um, you're alive from the dead, right. which is Christ. Yeah. And everything that it said before, you've already reckoned yourself dead, haven't you? In verse 7. Yeah, right. All right. So now let's see if the scriptures bear that out. Verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Now we're right back at the yeah. first. Or the second verse, you know, yes. or first verse, yes, that's right. and down. We're back at the same place, but he is trying his best to get you out of the theology of it yes. and move over here and just go, ah, uh, 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 you ain't sneaking up on me. I'm going to apply this. I'm not going to come under condemnation. I'm going to apply the truth of Christ and Him crucified. I'm determined not to know law and grace outside of the cross. And I'm going to stick with it. Amen. Okay? Yeah. So, what then? Shall we sin because we're no longer under the law but, uh, but under grace? God forbid. See, He's almost saying the same words. But He gave you the real answer and He's wanting you to see that clearly that this is exactly the cross and exactly your death with Christ, okay? Um, know ye not <laughs> that to whom... Okay, now look at this little... It looks like it's shifting. Don't do it, Paul. Don't do it. Um, uh, know ye not, this verse 16, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, His servants you are whom ye obey, okay? So, he, he, we're going, oh, okay, sin is saying, you know, come on, do it, man. <laughs> come on. <laughs> It'll be all right. You're under grace. You know, the blood of Jesus covered this. No, it didn't. The cross covered this, you know? And in this context, the cross covered it. He didn't even mention the blood. He just mentioned you. If you're dead, see, the blood is for somebody who's alive and keeps sinning. The cross is for someone who's dead and lives by Christ. All right? So, uh, know you not that to ye, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, that's verse 16. Know you not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are whom ye obey. So there again, two times it says to obey, to obey, to obey. You have to obey. You have to obey. You have to, you have to obey. And all we see out of that is I don't really do a lot of that. You know, <laughs> you know I try. <clears throat> I want to. But I don't. That, it's not talking to you in that context. 
It's saying, if you're dead, then he is your life and you need to yield your members to that one, that life, or to, because remember this came out of chapter 5, or to the old nature. Well, guess what? The word sin in this chapter is not the word for individual sins that we commit. It is sin nature. Well, 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 a letter from Mama. <laughs> it all fits together. Why didn't you mention this at the first, Randy? That would have helped. Because your little stinky mind doesn't see it as that. And you may not remember what the Greek word is later on. You'll just go, ah, that's me. You know, and he, I, why don't I obey, obey? Why don't you obey? And he'll go, because you're dead and you're not acting like it. And you're not being with me in the cross. Right. And, in, and me as the resurrection. Yes. See, you see, the obedience is to the life oh, while we embrace the death. Amen. The obedience is not me being obedient, but me being dead and therefore yielding to the life that the cross has brought to me through his death. Okay? Well, I mean, really, this is no different than the verse 1 through 11, you know. But it's a little more exciting here because we're getting to see that you can actually apply this in real situations that condemn you or beat you down or put you feel shame or this or that and whatever. And you go, well, you know, where's a cross fit here? I'm determined not to know anything but Christ and Him crucified, but how am I going to get shaped up? You're not. You're going to get dead. Crucified with Christ. That's going to be your hope. That's going to be the method. Okay. So, um, uh, the last part of that is, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked. But God be thanked. Because the question is, what are you obeying? Are you obeying the law? Are you obeying the rules? Are you obeying this or that? Are you obeying the nature of Christ? The nature of Christ. See, the law says, the, law, the Roman law said, if a Roman soldier comes up to you and conscripts you, you have to help him carry his load or do whatever he's doing for one mile. That's, that was the law. Roman citizens, Roman soldiers, you have to. It's the law. Jesus says, Here's my life. Let's go the second mile. When you get th done doing what he thinks is the law, say, hey, let's keep going, you know? And, I, you know, and he's going, really? Yeah. And he says, yeah. You know, so I'm going to be with you another, another mile. Um, I want to talk to you about Jesus. The life yeah. of God. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure we're not getting much of that on the thing. But you, you see what? You see that? You have to obey the life. Not the person, I'm obeying you, Jesus, the life yeah. Amen. within us. Okay? Um, and verse 17, but God be thanked. Amen, right? Thank you, God. That's, instead of reading it, do it. <laughs> but God be thanked. That ye were the servants of sin nature, but you have obeyed from the heart. What? What? I thought it was obeying from the will. No. Huh? I will obey. How's that go? I will obey. Anybody know that? Doctor Who? And anyway, I can't even remember the name of the, the robots. but the <laughs> Daleks. Yeah, they were the Daleks. I will obey. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, so it's not that. The Daleks obeyed. But they didn't do it from the heart. <coughs> Don't be a Dalek. I'm just saying. Because you, you, you know, because they're trying to kill Doctor Who, and we know who who is going to be talking about. It's Jesus. <laughs> All right. So, um, I'm getting close to the end here, in, in two different ways. Um. 
obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine, not the doctrine, the form of it in the form of Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ as life. Not just the, a doctrine of that. Uh, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Okay, so what does that mean? What is the actual translation of that? Being made free from sin nature, Christ is now the one who lives in you. That's the context. Can I get amen? That's not perverting the scripture. This is what it's trying to teach us. And if you'll see Romans 6 divided into two sections, you'll see it is clearly the, the, the Holy Spirit, the master putting it down, moving through Paul and saying, okay, here's the reality as it is in God's heart. And that reality is supposed to be in your heart. And it's supposed to be more real than your life there. And he goes, then, all right, so let's talk about it in your life. And let's make it real instead of you going back trying to be something outside of Christ. Um, verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Well, I can believe that. <laughs> For as, as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness to... Okay, so he's saying, and then it goes on, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. He's saying, you have yielded to the old nature, but the old man is dead. Did he not declare that in the verses above here? Know ye not, he says, know ye not that your old man is dead? So, so again, Romans 6, the, the flow of, of Mount Hermon coming down. And bringing that freshness and bringing that beauty of, of the Jordan River. And, and, and that flow talked about in, what is it, Psalm 133? You know, it's like the oil, you know, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Folks, it's, first it's talking about dwelling together. And next it's talking about brethren. But it pictures it as the body of the high priest. See, it's not saying, okay, so y'all need to do this. You're brethren. You're dwelling together. Only one really dwelling together is people lives on this property. <laughs> so, you know, so it's got to be something more spiritual. It's got to be that flow that comes down. Uh, the, like, it is like the oil that was poured on the head of Aaron uh, which represents Christ, our high priest. And it flows down the head and it flows down the beard. Thank God I got one to match the scripture right now. Uh, and then it starts going down to the body and it reaches the whole body. You say, you know, you realize that, you know, somebody says, well, you know, I'm the anointed of God. Well, no, you're not. You know, Christ is. But you are a member of his body, so that anointing that goes all the way down represents him, not you. Be with him. Why steal everything from him? You know, the word Messiah means what? The anointed one. Anointing. So we say, well, I'm the anointed of God. You're the Messiah? Really? Can you get away with that? And the, nobody in the church goes, are you saying you're the Messiah? You, know, you don't know. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Somebody should have stood up and said, well, you know, I'm not arguing with you, buddy, but I think the Messiah's already come. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be mean about it. <laughs> Just be accurate. <clears throat> okay. Um... um Verse 20, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Okay, what fruit? What fruit? You see that? Verse 20, immediately. In the, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. He's talking about fruit of the life of Christ or fruit from the, from the nature of sin. See, he keeps, he keeps giving us clues. He gives us enough 
clues where he wants us to get this in a real and in a practical way so that we're not tripped up by the very things he's trying to bring us into more of him in a more real way. Okay? <clears throat> what fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Okay? So here's the death now. Now he's going to emphasize the death. Uh, this is the same writer. This is Paul. This is the same chapter. This is Paul. This is the same chapter as verses 1 through 11. This is it. But he has changed the emphasis of death. He has said in those first 11 verses, it is the death of Christ and you should reckon on it. You should reckon yourself dead. Likewise, talks about Jesus being dead unto sin once. Sin hath no more dominion over him. Likewise, likewise reckon ye also yourselves because you're in him. Indeed unto sin, but it doesn't just say reckon yourselves dead. Understand. It says, reckon ye yourselves, I think it's verse 7, reckon yourselves dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus. We say, well, I'm alive unto God through what Jesus did. No, through the instrumentality. That's what the word through there is. It is through him. He's the instrument. He's the, it's been talking about that through all of this right here. It's been talking about yielding yourselves to your members to him and he will be the instrument through these things will come reckon yourself see a lot of people are always trying to reckon themselves dead but they never reckon themselves alive to God through Jesus Jesus is the life that I am alive unto God through you know and I'm reckoning on his life now because that's what it's calling for right now when it's got to these, 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 this section right here. It's really trying to press that we get this. All right? And I know I've said it 15 times, but I want you to get this like Paul did and the Holy Spirit did when he gave it to Paul and God did when he sent the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Make it real. Be alive unto God. Not just right with God through your good Christian ways. Um, for the end of those things, it's the end of verse 21, for the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God. Okay, so, so you are his members now. You are his branches now. You have become servants. Your members are his vehicles, but you are his members and you are um, now able to bring forth fruit because that's what it's going to say in the next follow up, able to bring forth his fruit. OK, um, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and and the end everlasting life. OK, so the fruit is what he brings forth as we yield to his life. Yeah. The end of it is eternal life. Mm -hmm. See, that doesn't mean the end of it is, gosh, it's time to quit. That doesn't mean the end is eternal life. I will, I will be saved and go to heaven. I got eternal life because I got saved. Because eternal life is life without beginning and without end. That's eternal life. You will have that life. Can I get a praise God? Praise God. Can I get a thanks be unto God? <laughs> whatever, that, whatever that is. Um, and then verse 23. For the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is what? Eternal life through the instrumentality of Jesus Christ. See, it's not, okay. I know I'm not going to go too, too much more here, but I'm just saying 
if there's someone standing here and the Lord is standing here, so the, that person that's standing here, they're going, oh, Jesus, you know, talking as two people, two separate people. Oh, Jesus, give me eternal life. Jesus would go, well, I can't give you the life you're th calling eternal life. I can only be Amen. eternal life because I'm without beginning and I'm without end. Amen. Okay. So the gift that I will give you is myself. This will only come through me as you live in me, in Christ. As you are secured in my death, so shall you be secure in my life. It's a good ending, huh? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you and we thank you for your word and we thank you that You've never meant to hide all this stuff or make it confusing for us, but our carnal minds still wander in the wilderness as if we have to obey and do the right thing. And we're wilderness wanderers that have not yet entered into the promised land. We've not yet crossed the Jordan. We've not yet come to Gilgal and applied the sharp knives. Much, and so we... we wonder why when we circle the town, Jericho doesn't fall down. Father, it's not because we're evil or lacking. It's because we're ignorant of what is in your heart. Uh, not, not doctrine, but the, the form of doctrine that is in your heart that you want formed in us, not taught to us. It's not an intellectual teaching you're trying to convey it is, it is a, a, a life exchange. It is a transfusion of our lifeblood to yours, as it were. And Father, I just, I just thank you for um, this sharing that you gave tonight that came from your heart and that these things are not just things that I know and teach. This is, this is coming from you, and it is, a, it is a cry. It is a hard cry, crying out. Um, out of your heart. It's not a sermon. It's a heart cry from your heart that we would, um, that we would be able to, to apply all the things that we've been taught about the cross and about Him being our life and that those things would be, would be um, uh, instituted into, incorporated into that we would become partakers of Christ and not just learners and hearers only. And Father, I, I, I say yes. I say yes. I want, I want your Son more formed in me. I say yes to what you said tonight, not to what I said. I say yes. And I, I uh, am in agreement with you. I am in, in agreement with you for me. I am in agreement with you for us. And um, so, Father, shake our little world of, of doctrine. Yes. Shake our little world of, of thinking we've got something when it, it clearly can't stand up to condemnation or shame or any of these things. It falters, and we fall back under the law feeling that we fail because the law condemns us. But, Lord, by the life of your Son, by the life of Christ, we will, we will understand you, Jesus, as the resurrection. We will understand you as also our death. And we will stay fixed in you, in Christ. We will not be moved. And even as we maybe falter in the process of getting this incorporated into us. It comes only, this portion, Father, only comes because we are in Christ. It's not trying to get us to live it outside of being in Christ. Father, it's not. It's telling us this is settled and secure and works now. And so, Father, in, in Jesus' name we ask this. It's in His name, and it's for His sake, and for the love of the Spirit.
us. He loves to share this life with us and loves Jesus and loves communicating not just truths, but the truth of Him, that is Him. When He said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. May we, Father, not want to quote that anymore without finally partaking of it, eating your flesh and drinking your blood in, in, in relationship to these truths. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.